a middle distance race. And this was in junior high, and all the school was there. And I remember, and I don't know how this happened, because I certainly wasn't the fastest, but somehow I'm running, and I'm in the lead. And there's like one more lap to go. And, of course, everybody in, in the stands is just screaming. And particularly, uh, well, I won't say, you know, you had different periods of P.E., and so you'd be cheering on your period of P.E., and so I'm running, I'm in the lead, people yelling for you, and then I heard over the PA, I think he's going to break the record. And boy, did that not energize me. So I'm running, and I'm running as fast as I can, and guess what? I won. I didn't break the record, but nonetheless, right? And I was thinking just the energy that people cheering me on and, and hearing that, just motivated me to give it as much as I could uh, to the finish line. Maybe you've experienced something like that in, in your running. But I want you to think about running this morning, just for a second. When you start that race, right, you, you run with a purpose, right? You're, you're, you know, you're trying to win the race. Amen? But if you're, if you know, you know, even if you... Are, like, for example, if I was to go run a 5K right now, it's not about winning it, it's about finishing it, right? <laughs> so that's, that's part of it. Just winning is the finishing, amen? You're just trying to do that. There's a, there's a purpose, there's a direction that you are going as you are running. It's interesting that in Scripture, the... Uh, the writer of Hebrews is going to use as a metaphor for the Christian life, running a race. Running a race. And it is a very good uh, metaphor for us when we talk about running the, living the Christian life. It is a race. It's not a sprint. It's more like a marathon. And, and it's, there's a lot of similarities Right? Because there is a direction that we are running. There is a purpose in what we do in life. And much like running, it's not easy. You know, marathoners talk about hitting a wall. It's difficult. There are going to be times in your walk of faith that it is going to be hard. It's going to be difficult going to be a challenge. And that's exactly what this writer of Hebrews is, is saying to this church who is feeling the heat of persecution. He's going to tell them, listen, you need to keep running the race and I want you to run it with endurance. So if you have your Bibles, please turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. As we continue our series going through the book of Hebrews, we're coming to a section that is very practical. In fact, for the rest of the, the book, it's very practical. It's a practical about how to live the Christian life. Right? And so we've entitled this series, uh, The Race Set Before Us, because the Christian life is, is a race. It is, it is a, a race that we are running. And the writer of, of Hebrews here is describing how to live a life of faith. How to run that life of faith. How to live it. God has placed us in this race and we are to finish it. We have a goal and we have a purpose. I like the way William Barclay puts it. The Christian is not an unconcerned stroller along the byways of life. He's a wayfarer on the high road. He's not a tourist who returns each night to the place where he starts. He is a pilgrim who is forever on the way. And the goal is nothing less than the likeness of Christ. That's what we're trying to do in our life. Every day we should be taking a step more and more as we live by faith to be like our Lord. That's growing. That's our direction. That should be our purpose. 
And it's all to his glory. So this morning we're going to consider the race that we are in. And in particular, I want us to talk about running the race um, that's set before us and running with endurance. Look, if you would, in verse 1 of Hebrews 12. It says, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us with endurance, or run, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So morning, this morning we want to look at how to run the race with endurance. The preacher encourages his audience to run with this endurance, the race that's set before them. And what is endurance? What is endurance? Endurance is that steady determination to keep going. No matter what. To keep moving forward. Think of those marathoners. They're on, what, mile 20. They hit the wall. They've still got some miles to go. But they keep going. They keep moving. Fighting through running step by step with endurance. In the New Testament, the characteristic of a man who is, this, this is how you would define endurance in the New Testament. It's the characteristic of a man who is not swayed from his deliberate purpose and his loyalty to faith and piety by even the greatest trials and suffering. It's one who keeps going despite the struggle that he is in that hangs on and trusts God in the midst of it all. That's endurance. It's interesting that the word that is translated for race, right, really it can mean struggle or fight. And it's true. If you've ran a race, it's not easy. It's not easy. It's a struggle. I've watched those... Um, cross-country guys running quite a bit since we have a few of you guys in here and they would run and I could you could just see it in their faces the agony the struggle right I remember yeah no I don't want to get there it's kind of graphic so anyways but it's it's tough it's tough so how do we run this race with endurance? The writer gives us three admonitions. Three admonitions on how to run. The first one is this. In order to run the race with endurance, we need the encouragement from the examples of those who lived a life of faith before us. Before us. Now that's exactly what he does here. Notice the very first word is therefore. I mean, he's connecting it back up to what he has already said to them in the, in the previous chapter. We all, here's the, I want you to get this, we all need encouragement in our walk of faith. Every one of us, every one of us will need to be encouraged somewhere in our lives to keep moving forward in our faith. Because there's a lot of discouragement out there. And a lot of people don't understand what it is to live by faith, and they mock it. We all need encouragement. The therefore connects it back to chapter 11 and, and the examples that he showed of men and women who lived by faith. He showed them, here's an example of living by faith. They are the cloud of witnesses surrounding us. Now when you hear this, your mind may go to a, a, a picture of a stadium. Right? And... and you know, here you got this stadium, like, kind of like the picture I described of me running. Everybody was around the track, and they're screaming and yelling for you, and you're going. And that might be the picture that you have in mind when you, when you read this, this verse. And that's really the, the way I, I originally thought it was, but as I studied this text more, I, I think it's a little different. I don't think it's the people lining the track screaming as you go. I think the thought here is, is not that they're looking down from heaven and cheering us, 
but we are looking to them as examples to encourage us to keep running. It's reversed. It's not them looking at us. It's us looking at them and their example. And the writer of Hebrews showed example after example of men and women who through hard times and through difficult times, they kept the faith and they kept running. We look to them for their, the example. That encourages us to keep moving forward. That's the thought here. That's the thought here. We see what a life of faith looks like. What, it can, what faith can accomplish in a life. And that encourages us to keep going. Paul does the, tells us the very same thing. Romans 15, 1 through 4, he says, Now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not just please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to his edification. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproach thee fell upon me. Now here's the point I want us to get. For whatever was written in earlier times was written, what, for our instruction that through perseverance and the encouragement of scriptures, we might have hope. How do we find encouragement to, to keep taking that next step of faith when things are just getting so hard and so difficult? We go back to scripture and we see the example of God working in the lives of men and women of faith. And we can see what God has done and what he did in their lives. And that gives us encouragement to keep going, to keep trusting, knowing God has got this under control. That's how you run with endurance. You go back to the examples. You go back to the Word. And you see these pictures of men and women who ran with faith. I think this is one of the problems why so many Christians struggle. is because, one, we're just not in the Word of God enough to look at these examples. We don't go there. We go to look at everything else. But we don't go back to Scripture and see the examples of men and women who kept going by faith. Unfortunately, that's the last place we turn to many times, is Scripture. And listen, you're going to have a tough time moving forward when it gets difficult if you're not bathing your, your, your heart in the Word of God. We all need encouragement. The Word of God gives it to us. And it's not, again, it's not, and I always say this because so many people say, oh, that's, that's all you tell us is pray and read, pray and read the Bible. It's not the fact that you just read the Bible and abracadabra, all my problems go away. That's not the way this works. What I'm encouraging you to do is read the examples of men and women who God has worked in their lives and trust that God can do the same. It's faith. He may not take you out of the problem, but he certainly can help you through it. That's how we run with endurance. Well, there's a second way that the writer tells us how to run, and that's this. In order to run with endurance, we need to remove the things which hinder us from reaching the goal. That hinders us from running the race with endurance. Now this is simply using common sense. Years ago, I used to have, uh, I don't have them now, but I would have these things we call ankle weights. Anybody ever have ankle weights? Some of you still do, right? And what do you do? You go out there and you put those weights on and you run and it builds up strength in your legs, right? That's a good thing. Nothing, nothing wrong with that, right? But when you go to run a race, what do you do? 
you take those weights off. It would be crazy to start the race when you've got these weights on your legs. Why would you do that? It makes no sense. It's also like, you know, when you see the, the track people come out, they're out there, they're warming up, they've got their sweats on, right? They've got their sweats on. They're warming up. They're loosening up. But when they race, what do they do? They take them off. It's crazy to try to race in, in, a, in a blue jeans. Why would you do that? You want to get clothing that's light and free where you can run. You lay aside all the weights that would hinder you from running. And that's exactly what he's talking about here. The preacher is encouraging the church to lay aside any encumbrance and the sin that entangles us. That's what he says in, in verse 1. Let us lay aside every encumbrance, one, and the sin, two, which so easily entangles us. So two things we're to lay off here. The first one is this. The encumbrance does not mean something that is necessarily bad. It's, it, it, it doesn't mean some kind of, uh, 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 that you're doing something that is wrong in, in, in any way, right? That's the encumbrance that he's speaking about here. But the reality is, there are some things in life that may be good, but may be hindering us in our walk of faith. That's not helping us in our growth. That's keeping us from being who God wants us to be. Again, it's not something that's bad. It could be something very okay, something that's normal and right. But it's just in the way of our journey. And that's the hard truth. Some things in life must be rejected if we want to faithfully run. And that's hard for us to get our heads around. If something is getting in the way of your relationship with Jesus and your spiritual growth, then the writer is telling us, hey, we need to get rid of it. Just like you would get rid of a weight before you would run. Listen, this could be anything from being in front of a screen too much or being involved in too many activities. These things could be hindering your walk. It could be keeping you from spending time with God. It might be stunning your spiritual growth. Even though it's good, it needs to be removed. Now, this is obviously where I'm getting in the kitchen with everybody. Because if you're like me, this is something that I have to think about. Because like you, I struggle with trying to make sure that I have my time with God and His Word just for me, to feed my soul. And if I struggle, I know you do too. Because you guys are busy, and you guys are working, and you guys got life. It's difficult, amen? So we need to think through these things. And the issue is probably different for each one of us. But we need to evaluate our lives. That's true. The sin that so easily entangles us, well, that should be pretty obvious. Think of, um, and this is kind of the, in the Greek, the, the wording, think of somebody who is uh, wearing a long robe or something, and he's going to try to run a race. What's going to happen? You're going to get tangled up as you run in that robe, and you're going to land smack on your face. Right? Unless you gird it up like they would do back in the olden days. If you're just trying to run it, you're going to fall flat on your face. That is what sin does in our lives. 
It's exactly what sin does in our lives. It entangles us. It entangles us. Right? It causes us to not grow. In fact, sin in our lives becomes a breach between us and God. God says, if you, if you regard iniquity in your heart, he will not hear you. It hinders your prayer life because you have sin in your life. Sin is an issue, and it will trip you up. I don't care who you are. It will trip you up. It'll stop you from running. And that's the point. Sin is never for your benefit, folks. It is always a train wreck waiting to happen. You may be enjoying it for a while, but it will come back and bite you. It will bite you. And you know when you're doing it. And you know when you're hiding it. It will come back and get you. So what's the answer? To put it off. To repent. Say, God, help me not go down this road again. Help me to take this weight off. The point is, it's really hard to run the race that God has set for us to run when we've got so many things hindering us. So many things tripping us up. So I will ask you the question, and this is where we, we need to discern. Are you living more like Jesus this year than this time last year? Have you thought about that? Are you closer to the Lord today than you were this time last year? Are you growing? Are you moving forward in your faith? If you're not, then maybe you've got some things that are weighing you down that you need to get rid of. This is what he is saying here. And who can answer that? I can't answer that for you. Only you can answer that. And that means you need to be honest with God. You know, the army of Alexander the Great was advancing on Persia. And at one critical point, it appeared that his troops might be defeated. And the soldiers had taken so much plunder from their previous campaign that they had become weighted down with, with, uh, with all this weight and carrying all that stuff, and they were losing their effectiveness in battle. So Alexander immediately commanded that all the spoils be thrown into a heap and burned. The men complained, complained bitterly, but soon came to the wisdom of the order. And someone wrote, it was as if wings had been given to them and they walked lightly again. Victory was assured that point you see that's the problem with us it's not so much that the things we're doing is bad it's just the things that we're doing is hindering what we really should be doing we need to sometimes stop settling for the good and be more concentrated on the great that god wants in your life get rid of the good and go for the great and that can look like a lot of different things in our life but I think this is one of the reasons why, as Christians, we, we find ourselves not running with endurance and struggling in our walk is because we're just too busy. We're just too distracted by the things of this world. And listen, we have so much out there. Satan doesn't have to attack us he just distracts us. And it weighs us down from truly being what God wants us to be in our lives. So in order to run with endurance, we need to remove the things which hinder us from reaching the goal. But there's one more thing that he writes in these verses, and that's this. Oops. No. In order to run the race with endurance, we need to stay focused on the goal. 
Notice what he writes in two, verses 2 and 3. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Notice what he writes in, in these verses. Again, imagine a runner. You're running a race, and all you're doing is looking down at your feet. What's going to happen? If all you're doing is, and you're running this race, and you're just, you know, you're just admiring the way you're running, right? You're looking at your feet. What's going to happen? You'll probably run off the track. You might run into another runner. It, it's like, and this, this is the modern, maybe, maybe you can relate to this more. It's the person who's got their cell phone and all they're doing is walking and doing this. I love watching those videos, right? You know what's going to happen. They're, they're, something's bad. They're going to walk into a lake or fall in a hole or whatever. Because they're, they're, they're doing this. And they're not looking where they're going. Well, the writer of Hebrews is saying, look, you need to keep your eyes on what? On Jesus. You need to fix your eyes on him. The word fix carries the idea of a looking away from other things and putting your attention on this. That's the thought there. It's getting your eyes off of the world and focusing them on Christ. It is the song that we, we used to sing a lot. I have decided to follow Jesus no looking back, no looking back. That's exactly what this is. The runner is not to look at the crowd around him, but to look ahead at the course. So are we. The writer is pleading with this church to turn their eyes away from their problems and turn them and put them on Jesus. Notice how he defines Jesus. It says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of the faith. He is it, folks. That's who we're to look to. It is him who we trust in. It is him who we placed our faith in. It is him who we are trying to be like. He is, he is it. And we're to keep our eyes on him. And notice in describing this, and I, and I found this interesting, I say, it says, we are to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Now, here's the interesting phrase. Who for the joy set before him, here's that word endured again. It comes up in every verse this morning. Endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. It's interesting, for, for years, as I, and, and, you know, and I've always thought that this verse meant that, and it could be, I, I'm not saying it's not, that Jesus endured the cross, the pain of the cross, because he saw the joy set before him. And what is that joy? Well, that you and I will come to him and be right, mean, right with God through what he's doing, and that he will be exalted I mean, there, there is joy. He's sitting right now at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us. Amen. That is awesome. And he deserves all of our praise. No question. But what's interesting about this verse, and, and is causing me to think it, it, at it differently, is the word for. It says, for the joy set before him. Well, the Greek word for for there usually is interpreted as instead of. So what is this verse saying? Well, instead of the joy that Jesus could have had prior to the cross, which would have been what? Not going to the cross. He would have not suffered that, that pain. He would have not endured that shame. Instead of that joy, what did he do? He went to the cross and endured it for you and I. He 
and here's really what it comes down to, he, in, he obeyed the will of the Father. He obeyed the will of the Father. He could have chose, I guess, not to have done that, to disobey the Father, to not do the will of the Father, and not go on the cross. But instead, he set aside the joy that he could have had right then, that instant gratification, and instead obeyed God and went to the cross and endured it for you and I. And, I, and when I was studying this, my mind went back to the garden where he's praying and he's sweating, you know, blood, because he knew what was ahead for him. And he said, if there's any way to remove this cup, remove it. I think as a man, he knew exactly what was going ahead for him. Suffering that we could never truly understand. But I love his words, and these are the words that should just make us shout. He says, but not my will, but thy will be done. And he obeyed the will of the Father for you and I. He set aside that temporary joy for something greater. I think that is the thought here. Much like when we talked about Moses earlier, who set aside all the riches of Egypt and instead would rather endure hardness with his brothers. That's what the writer of Hebrews is telling this, this, this church. Don't, don't take the easy way out. Don't go back into Judaism thinking that that's the answer. It's not. It will give you temporary joy and relief from what you're enduring, but it's not the answer. That's the point he, here. He's telling them to focus on Jesus. And when you and look in verse in verse three, for consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. He said, look, I want you to keep your eyes on Jesus and I want you to consider, to think about what he went through. And, and the thought of considering is you're comparing. You're comparing what he went through and what you're going through. And listen, whenever you compare that, we cannot even uh, imagine what Jesus went through, certainly harder than anything we've gone through. And he's saying, when you consider that and you think about that, that will help you not to give up. Not to lose heart. Not to grow weary. That's the thought here. Jesus is our example. We're to be like him. When things get hard in our lives, those exactly the times we got to make sure we're focusing on Christ and finding the strength and help that we need. It was true for that church back then. It's true for us today. Our goal is to be like him. Our goal is to finish this race, the, set, the course that's set before us. Our goal is to endure. To live in a way that honors and glorifies God. And that's what he's encouraging this church to do. If you notice, in each of these three verses, the word endurance came up. We're to run with endurance. It talked about Jesus uh, enduring the cross. Verse 3 talks about, again, that he endured such hostility. The point is here, the preacher is making this argument to the church that they need to hang in there, they need to endure, they need to finish the race that's set before them. You know, when I used to go running, I would always, uh, uh, I would always try to sprint at the end. 
And it was my reminder to myself that it doesn't matter how you began. It mat what matters is how you finish. How you finish. That was my way of just keeping in mind that that's the important part. When it comes to my life here on earth, I hope I finish strong for Christ. There are many who start off following Christ strong, but it goes the other way. Somewhere down the line, they stop running the race. I've seen that so much. It's like a runner who sprints off the starting line, uh, like he's running a 100-yard dash and he's running a marathon. And you know what will happen. It won't be long till he'll be out of the race. They didn't endure to the end. The writer is telling this church that if they went back into Judaism, if they, if they, would, they would just say, you know what, I'm done, I'm going back, I'll, I'll, I'll be relieved of this, it's really showing them, as we've seen, that they never had faith in the first place. There's only one way to endure, and that's by faith. Now, as I mentioned, I've seen a lot of people now, people that I used to hang around with, who professed Christ for many years, and then they just stopped. They're out of the race. I mean, it's not just the fact that they don't attend and worship God anymore. It's the fact that they don't care that they're not concerned about anything with God at all. And they've embraced the values of the world. I don't understand that. I don't know why they stopped. I can't read their hearts, but they just dropped out of the race. Now again, was there ever faith in the first place? I don't know. I can't read their hearts. That's between them and God. And I don't know why they stopped. And you know what? Maybe God will get a hold of their heart and they'll get back in the race. To that I say amen. I think a true child of God, that's exactly what happens. Is they may go away for a while and God gets a hold of their heart. And guess what? They're even on fire more so now as they live for Christ. That can happen. Amen? I mean, as long as we've got breath, there's hope. God can do a work in any life. I truly believe that. But that's not about others. It's about us. It's about me. I want to finish my walk with endurance, with faith. God wants us to run this race with endurance, and it takes God for us to do that. It takes faith. So let me just say, how are you doing in the race? Are you taking time to find encouragement in God's word? I hope you are. Are you examining your life to see if there's anything hindering from the race that you're running? I think you should. Are you looking to Jesus as the example and the goal of your life? I hope you are. Let me encourage you this morning for all of us. Let's, let's run with endurance the race that God has set before us. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this time once again to look into your word and to see the truth that uh, was brought out. And Father, we know that in our lives comes difficulties and there will be struggles just like it would be in a race. And so Father God, I pray that you would help each one of us to run with endurance, Father God. And the only way we can do that is by faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, Father, help us to keep our eyes on him as we, as we live this life. And may we live in a way that truly brings you honor and glory in all that we do. So I pray, Father, for the one that's here that, that may be struggling in their walk, in their race, Father God. I pray that if, if there's something that's hindering, that today would be the day that they would acknowledge it. And, God, that they would seek to remove it in their lives to your honor and to your glory. But I especially pray for the one that may be here that has not even entered the race, that does not know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, that today would be the day that they would come to him in saving faith. Thank you, Father God, for being such a good God. 
for loving us so much, for helping us to live in this broken world. I don't even know how you can live in this world without a hope, a hope in Jesus. So thank you, Father. And we give you all the glory, honor, and praise. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and let's sing. This is an appropriate song for us, right? This is the song to talk about when we talk about laying aside all our weights that would hinder us from doing what God is wanting us to do. I surrender all. I pray that each one here can sing this with their whole heart, that they surrendered all and follow Christ. Now's the time to respond as we sing. And all to Jesus I surrender all to Him I freely give and I will ever love and trust Him in His presence give to God, listen, we're going to get more in return. Amen? Amen? Absolutely. You may be seated. I'm going to take a moment for uh, announcements, and then we will uh, go outside and have a time of refreshments, coffee, and uh, donuts. Amen. All right, so I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward. I know we're going to need a few here. Uh, again, uh, this is an opportunity for our church to get back to God and to uh, just give back what he's given us so freely. And so, uh, again, if you're a guest, thanks for being with us. You're in no way compelled to give. This is our way of our church family to give back to our great Lord. All right, in your pews are the communication cards. If you're a guest, thanks for being with us. Please fill out the card. Let us know you were here. I would love to send you a card just thanking you for being with us. And if we can be of any help to you, please let us know. Uh, if you have a prayer request that you'd like to share, that you'd like the church to pray about, please write it down. 
And uh, again, fill out these cards, drop them in the offering plate. We'll send out our prayer requests um, on Monday for our church family to pray about during the week. Amen. Wednesday night, we'll continue our study through the book of Revelation. We are in chapter 19, and this Wednesday night should be a good one. Our Lord returns, so amen. amen. Uh, I hope he returns so I don't have to do the lesson. That would be awesome. <laughs> uh, amen. But meanwhile, uh, I'll get ready for it anyways. Uh, we should all be ready for his return. Amen? All right. So there we go. Uh, also, during the week, we have two Zoom Bible studies to be aware of. Uh, the youth have their Bible study from 7.30 to 8.30, so all the information is a bulletin. Also, Thursday night, we have an adult Bible study that meets on Zoom, and that begins at 8 o'clock. All right, Celebrate Recovery. Here's a great opportunity for you to get a little more support and encouragement from brothers and sisters uh, if you're going through a difficult season in your life. There's the place to go. Uh, five o'clock on Saturday nights. Uh, next week, we will have our Welcome to FMBC class. So if, if you're interested in knowing more about our church and how to join, this is the class to go to. We'll tell you everything, who we are, what we believe. You can ask any questions you want. Uh, this is a, just sign up at the Welcome Center. It'll be upstairs next week at 1045. All right, and also next week, we're looking forward to just time for us to hang out together. Uh, you know, we don't, a lot of times we don't get the time during the week to just spend and, and talk and fellowship. Well, we'll do that and play some games at the same time. So uh, come on out. We'll have some hot dogs and hamburgers. We'll play some board games. Just a great time of fellowship. All are welcome. Please sign up at the Welcome Center so we can get an idea with food if you're going to plan on going. But we're just going to hang out, play some games. Uh, I'm going to try to talk Vince into bringing uh, Ticket to Ride, if you ever played that game. Uh, one of my favorites, so we'll, we'll play that. And just all kinds of games and just fun. So come on out, and that'll be uh, this next Sunday. All right, the next outreach is Saturday, April 27th. So if you'd like to be a part of this, you're more than welcome to join us as we go out into the community and tell people about Jesus. Amen. And Youth Movie Day. So our youth will be having a movie day on Sunday, April 28th from 12 to 4. They'll be watching the movie The Iron Giant. So there'll be snacks, food, and drinks. So come on out for that, all you youth. Should be a good time. For more information, talk to Vince over here about it. And BBS. All right, we're already just getting excited about that. That will be happening on July 19th through 21st. So you'll be getting more information about that the closer we get. So uh, we'll be praying about that uh, event as we reach out in the neighborhood and, and uh, tell children about Jesus. Amen. Uh, and for more information, check our webpage, fmbcbellflower.org. Amen. I'm going to ask Vince if he'd come forward and bless the offering uh, this morning. Stand, please. Let's pray. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this message, God. We just thank you um, for this uh, just example, God, of just how we can um, just persevere, Lord. Just help us, please, to just apply this message to our lives, God. And um, Lord, just when times get tough, just help us trust in you and just persevere through whatever trials we may go through, God. And just, uh, Lord, just bless this offering. Just uh, use it to further your ministries, Lord. And just uh, forgive us of our sins, Lord. And we just love you and thank you for all you do. Jesus, let me pray. Amen. Amen. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Amen. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still.
shining down on me when the world's all as it should be blessed be your name blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering though there's pain in the offering blessed be your name sing this out every blessing Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will sing. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name. said. Amen. Have a great week.